There's been a football club in Leeds for over a century, but it's the recent history of Leeds United that has set the club at odds with its fans and drawn serious criticism in Parliament. Calling Leeds United fans morons, um, you know, dissidents, these type of things. It's not a very nice way to talk to the, the fans. We want our club back! I think people find it incredible that Ken Bates had no knowledge of who the owners of the club were. Tax havens are not just about tax. In fact, the name is misleading. The real benefit they provide to their clients is secrecy. The president can move, the owner can move, the coach can move, the players they can move, but who will stay always in the, in the stands, in the stadium, are the fans. I'm David Conn. I'm an investigative sports writer for The Guardian newspaper. For six years, Leeds United was administered by a company here in Switzerland on behalf of owners who were never identified. Then in May this year, Ken Bates bought the club via a company based in a tax haven. But does that decision to suddenly buy Leeds United after six years raise more questions than it answers? Well, it's the heart of the community, it's, it is the heart of the city for many people. You know, the city always feels happier when the football club's doing well, and it's nice to think that it's doing it in a decent way, and, a, and in a way that other people can look at and admire. It's generally accepted that the Peter Ridsdale era was financially disastrous for Leeds. Champions League semi-finalists of 2001, two years later, the club had crippling debts. Should we have spent so heavily in the past? Probably not. But we lived the dream. A group of local businessmen known as the Yorkshire Consortium took over at Elland Road in March 2004. They were led by an insolvency expert, Gerald Krasner. As far as I was concerned, this was a labour of love. Normally I charge a lot of money for this work. Believe it or not, this was done for nothing. Our primary aim was to financially stabilise the club because if we didn't do that, uh, effectively the club was finished. Two months later, the consortium's hopes of turning the financial situation around were in tatters. United were relegated from the Premier League. Yeah, it's a disappointing day for everybody connected with the club. Krasner's consortium now had to sell many of the club's assets to try to balance the books. That meant players, the training ground at Thorpe Arch and even Elland Road itself. By the start of 2005, the Yorkshire consortium wanted out. Despite their efforts to stabilise the club's financial position, they hadn't been able to cut the club's debts down to manageable levels. Then, just at their darkest hour, an unlikely guardian angel arrived from the tax haven of Monaco. Ken Bates was born in London in 1931. Brought up by his grandparents on a council estate, Bates made his money wheeling and dealing. He dabbled in ready-mixed concrete, property and banking. He also invested in football. Oldham Athletic in the 1960s, and then three decades ago, he bought one of London's most glamorous clubs. Chelsea were almost bankrupt in 1982 when Ken Bates bought the club, famously for just one pound. In the two decades he was here, he built Chelsea into one of England's most glamorous and successful clubs, while always caught in controversy. Bates's position, uh, visibly Leeds, uh, they thought he was the, the living saviour, uh, and that is how he presented himself. He did the same at Chelsea, he's done it in all sorts of places. He's the man who comes when death is standing at the door uh, and promises uh, to breathe new life into the corpse. But by 2003, Ken Bates' success at Chelsea was threatened by £80 million of debt. Good evening. The biggest takeover in English football has been agreed tonight. Just as things looked bleak for Ken Bates, he pulled off an astounding business coup, selling the club in the summer of 2003 to the Russian oligarch, Roman Abramovich. For the Chelsea shares that he had paid just £1 for, Ken Bates was paid £17 million. A number of other unidentified shareholders based in various offshore tax havens 
also sold out to the Russian at the same time. Bates retired to his flat in the tax haven of Monaco. He seemed to have walked away from English football forever. But football was in Ken Bates' blood. And out of the blue, in January 2005, he flew into Yorkshire. Once more, all eyes are on Leeds United. Tonight, just a week after denying any interest in the club, Ken Bates looks set to take control at Ellen Road. And I promise the Leeds fans, uh, you still a black phase. We're going to have a lot, a lot of laughs. With Krasner's consortium wanting out of Leeds United, a deal with Bates was quickly agreed. Bates paid them almost nothing, but promised to settle the club's most urgent tax bill. We had taken it as far as we could. We had no further monies to put in. We were not rich men. We were people who would put time and effort in. And we took a view that if Leeds United was to move forward, it needed new investment. We thought that the Krasner board had got out of its depth, despite their best efforts. Um, there was a fear of out of the frying pan into a different fire. But had Bates' apparent success at Chelsea blinded the Yorkshire consortium to his colourful financial history? I don't think Ken Bates is a man who's much to be proud of his reign at Chelsea. Although he rescued the club from bankruptcy, he sold it when it was pretty bankrupt too, so that's not a great achievement. In the meantime, of course, he redeveloped the ground and earned a lot of money for himself from it. But I don't think that selling it to a Russian oligarch was a great service to the fans. The headlines suggested that Bates had personally taken over Leeds, but in fact Bates only claimed to be the UK representative of a company based in the Cayman Islands, a Caribbean tax haven. This company, called Forward Sports Fund, or FSF, was established for the sole purpose of buying Leeds. To further complicate matters, FSF was managed by a Swiss company called Chateau Fiduciaire. Chateau Fiduciaire has always refused to reveal the identity of the owner or owners of Leeds United. We're dealing with someone who is resident offshore, let's say in somewhere like Monaco, and they've set up their company, the ownership of their company through offshore structures. Then they're in a position basically to not pay tax on anything, above all on capital gains. Now capital gains arise when you sell a company for a profit. So although FSF owned Leeds United from 2005, Nobody had a clue who owned FSF. Many believed Ken Bates had to be the owner, but he has always maintained he wasn't. Oh, uh, who are they? Uh, the one condition they made of coming in was they did not want any publicity or their idea to be disclosed because they've seen what happened in football. When it later transpired that he had no involvement, no money in it, and in fact, didn't even know who he was working for, who the ultimate owners were. Um, I was incredulous. But Mr. Bates, in my opinion, is not somebody who would work for an unknown person. Leeds United, the Yorkshire club, was administered from here, the Rue de Rhone in Geneva, Switzerland. On the fifth floor of this building is Chateau Fiduciaire, which represented FSF, operating under strict Swiss secrecy laws, legally obliging it not to reveal the identity of its clients. Since the 60s, Bates has developed the habit of working with companies based offshore. But what are the benefits of working through tax havens? Tax havens are not just about tax. In fact, the name is misleading. Uh, professionally, we call them secrecy jurisdictions because the real benefit they provide to their clients is secrecy. As a football fan, it's important to me that I know who owns my club. And the trouble is when you have a structure which is set up in a tax haven and you don't really know who's behind that, inevitably you can start worrying about is this club being ripped off? Is there money laundering behind this club? Is there, are there any other kind of bad activities which we don't know because we can't find out who actually owns this club? After the takeover, FSF injected around £4.5 million into Leeds to pay off the club's most urgent debts. And in Bates' first full season in charge, Leeds came oh so close to returning to the riches of the Premier League. They reached the playoff final under manager Kevin Blackwell. Within 18 months to take it round, to walk out at Cardiff 
in front of 60,000 Leeds fans who are just different classes supporters was maybe the most proudest day of my career. That defeat had huge financial consequences. With no more parachute payments from the Premier League, Leeds' income fell dramatically and over the summer, more players were sold at Elland Road. Soon afterwards, Blackwell was sacked and replaced by Dennis Wise. But by the spring of 2007, things looked bleak on the pitch and in the boardroom. The club tried to borrow £25 million from Leeds City Council to buy back Elland Road and Thorpe Arch. But the deal collapsed, partly because the club refused to reveal the identity of the owners of FSF. We regard, actually, the present management at Leeds United to be running a very tight ship uh, and uh, a great deal tighter than a number of other football clubs. Uh, nevertheless, in 2007, we wanted absolute crystal clear uh, information and that was not forthcoming. At the time, we were uh, unable to ascertain despite asking very pointed questions, either who owned the ground or who owned the football club. The decision not to lend any money to Leeds United would prove to be a very wise one for the council. A few weeks later, in April 2007, the club's already precarious financial predicament worsened substantially. A late Ipswich equaliser meant that Leeds United were relegated to the third tier of English football for the first time in the club's history. Relegation was a huge financial blow. Just two and a half years after Ken Bates took over Leeds, the club was effectively bust. The club had debts of over £35 million, much of it owed to businesses and organisations across the region. West Yorkshire Police were owed £80,000, Leeds Metropolitan University was owed £46,000, and many small businesses also lost money, including this family-run bakery in North Leeds. The £3,000, it doesn't sound a lot of money in the big scheme of things, but you know, when rolls are a very small unit price, you've got to make a lot of rolls to make £2,500. And how would you describe overall the impact on your business, and did it take you some time to recover? Well, it did, because we, we still got to pay our suppliers. The accountancy firm KPMG tried to organise a deal whereby at least three quarters of the creditors of Leeds would agree to accept less than they were owed. Bates's first offer was just a penny for every pound owing. And the taxman, who was asking for over £7 million back, threatened to go to court. Leeds were in danger of going out of business completely. We were staring into the abyss. It was a, it was a scary time, thinking that there could be no more Leeds. In English football, when a club goes bust, the rules say that any money it owes to players or to other clubs have to be paid in full. But the other people to whom a club owes money, which can be small businesses, charities and public bodies, and the tax authorities, they have to wait in line for a fraction of what they're owed. I must admit that the football creditors rule was something I'd heard of, but I didn't really understand the reality of, of how it was used um, until we started getting into this committee. And I was really appalled by, by what I found. All football creditors must be paid in full. And a football creditor is any of the football club owed money or any footballer owed wages or transfer money. Incidentally, a football manager is not a football creditor. The former manager, Kevin Blackwell, was the club's biggest non-football creditor. He was owed almost £1 million by Leeds. Of the rest of Leeds' debt, £8 million was owed to the football creditors. Of what remained, around half was owed to two obscure offshore companies called Astor Investment Holdings and Crato. These two trusts had apparently lent Leeds United almost £15 million over the previous 18 months. Ken Bates, and his legal representatives denied having any connection to them whatsoever. But just who were these companies? Astor was registered in the British Virgin Islands and Crato in nearby Nevis. Both are tax havens, and that means the names of the owners remain a closely guarded secret. KPMG now put Leeds up for sale through a very unusual auction process. The winner would be the bidder who offered to pay off the highest percentage of the creditors' losses. But oddly, Astor, Crato and FSF agreed to waive their combined debts of £18 million, but only if FSF were the winners of the auction.